Our default position as strugglers is to believe that God's disappointed and frustrated. That he simply is tolerating us. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1 says, no, 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 no. Before the foundation of the earth was laid, he was going to adopt you, make you holy and blameless in his sight. So whether difficult days or good days, God's at work. God has not abandoned you in this difficult season. How amazing does that make our God that in our hypocrisy, he's long suffering with us. In our inability to live out all that he would call us to, he continues to lavish upon us his grace. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. So I love this word lavish, extravagant, plentiful, over the top. And so now when the Bible's talking about forgiveness, it's saying that his grace in forgiveness is lavish, like it's too much, like it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous amount, right? It's, it's, it's weight, it's over the top. It's out of control. Man of woman of God, in Christ but struggling, God does not regret saving you. He doesn't regret it. You haven't surprised him. You cannot surprise him. God is not watching where you are now, watching how you've struggled this week, watching how you stumble and fall, and regretting the decision to pay the price for you in full. You have no sin past present and future that has more power than the cross of Jesus Christ. None. This means that your salvation wasn't just a past event alone, but that Christ even now is continuing to save you. He didn't forgive your past sins and now leaving it up to you to conquer present and future sins, which means it doesn't matter how you came in here. It means God can rescue. It means God can save. And it means for those of us who are in Christ, you do not disgust him. You do not discuss it. You don't know what I struggle with and how deplorable it is. Um, I know that Jesus would say that he paid the bill in full, and so what you're saying is nonsense. That is the grace with which he lavished on us in his forgiveness. Good morning, Mountain Movers Church. And good morning to you guests that are joining us, and also good morning to you joining us online. Today is an awesome day. We have a lot of great things in store. This is yet another one of our the parts to this awesome mystery series, and we've got a curveball for you this morning. But before we get to that, I want to mention that November 1st, look at somebody and say November 1st. November 1st. Something big is going to happen. You guys need some work. Okay, look at somebody else that has a little bit more energy and excitement about being in God's house this morning and say, November 1st, something exciting is going to happen. We have one of the strongest men in the world that is going to be right here. J.D. Anderson, the Iceman, is going to be joining us. He has traveled all over the world, and he is the world record holder for breaking the most sheets of ice, running through them with his shoulder. He tears license plates in half with his teeth. With his teeth. He can take a deck of cards and stick them in his mouth and just rip them in half. He is incredibly incredibly strong but that's not what is so impressive about this guy what is so impressive about this guy is he is madly in love with Jesus and he travels all over the place he does big school assemblies and then he goes to churches and he shares his testimony and shares the supernatural strength that God has given him to share the gospel of Jesus Christ it's awesome he is world renowned and he's going to be right here at Mountain Movers Church to share what God is doing and has done in his life so your job in this is to invite as many friends as you possibly can to get here and fill this place up so we can see some people one for Jesus Christ. It's going to be awesome. Good morning. Hey, I want to share a little story about my life with you guys this morning. I grew up in it. Well, I didn't grow up, but when I was a young boy, we lived in a town called Vera. And if you don't know where Vera is at, it's between Tulsa and Bartlesville. Now, Vera was a pretty small town, and it was so small, in fact, that the local gas station 
was also the post office, the grocery store, the fire department, the embroidery shop, and so on. But one thing that Vera was not lacking was churches. I, I'm pretty sure when I look back as a kid, I'm, I'm thinking that every corner in Vera had a church on it. So I think back and I think, hey, it must have been the summer of 1983, and I know I'm kind of aging myself there. In 1983, I went, to, I went to vacation Bible school, and that was the first time that, that I learned a piece of Scripture out of God's Word. Now, I think probably some of us in this room have, have learned this piece of Scripture at a young age, too, and that was John 3.16. And it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, that's probably one of the easiest Scriptures in the Bible to learn, especially for youngster. But you know, there was a problem with me learning that Scripture at a young age. See, there was no follow-through. When I was growing up, we didn't frequent church on Sunday mornings. We just didn't go. Now, we would go on special occasions, you know, Christmas, Easter, funerals, weddings. You get the idea. Now, as I, when we moved to Missouri, I started going to church on occasion with, with the neighbors. But as a family, we were not churched. We didn't go. As, as I grew up and I got older, you know, I could still recite John 3.16 on demand. It had stuck with me my entire life. But I had no clue what it meant. I didn't, I didn't realize what was going on. So as I, as I it, it was not probably not until I was in my 30s that I actually understood what John 3.16 meant. It wasn't until I got serious about my relationship with Jesus and started trying to live my life as a mirror image of His that I actually got it. Now, I was baptized into the Church of the Nazarene when I was 12 or 13 years old. But I look back and I think, hey, you know what, I probably did that because some of the kids in the neighborhood were being baptized. And I thought, hey, I want to fit into that clique and I want to be cool like they are, so that's what I'm going to do. But I didn't know Jesus. And the truth of the matter is, had Jesus come back the next day, I probably would have spent eternity in hell. Because being baptized, that didn't mean that I was saved. Being baptized didn't mean that God had forgiven me of my sin. Being baptized was just a symbol for me at that time of being cool. Now, since that time, I have experienced what I believe is a real and life-changing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And my life has forever been changed because now I can confidently say, hey, I have that relationship with Jesus. I have a life, a real and, and life-changing relationship with Jesus that is contagious. So the question that, that I want to ask today is, how does a person know when God has forgiven them for sinning? And the only way that we can address this is to look at God's Word. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, we're going to find some scripture in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, and we're going to start there. So if you have your Word, open to that, and if not, it'll be up here on the screen and you can follow there. 1 John chapter 1, 5 through 9 says, This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So if we are lying, if we are lying, if we, we are, so we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth, but if we are living in light as God is in light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. So we could end this right here. Right there in verse 9 it says, If we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. God is faithful to His covenant, He is faithful to His people, and He is faithful to His word. God is, not, God is a just God, and He has provided a sacrifice for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and through His sacrifice, His righteousness is declared in the justification of sinners. You know, God sent His Son not only to die for our sin on the cross, but He promised His Son that, hey, if, if people, those people that come through you, they're going to be forgiven. But we have to come through Jesus. Isaiah 53, 11 says, When He sees all that is accomplished by His anguish, he will be satisfied, and because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all of their sins. God is gracious, and he offers forgiveness to the repenting sinner. God cleanses us from all the, the guilt of unrighteousness, 
And in due time, He's going to deliver us from, from the power and the practice of sin. The confession of our sin to God with a repentant heart leads to the, the cleansing of all unrighteousness. And God is faithful and forgiving. You know, I want you to think about it this way. You Say you're, you're a parent and, and you have a couple of young boys and those boys love to play baseball. But one day you look out in the yard and those boys are out there playing catch. Now, a lot of us, we'd be in the same part of the yard playing catch. But these two boys are one in the front yard and one in the backyard. Which means they're throwing the ball over the rooftop. So you go out and you say, hey, boys, 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 let's not do that. Why? Why not? Well, because kids, kids ask questions, right? Well, first of all, because I said so. And secondly, you could get hurt or knock out a window. Oh, okay, whatever. So they blow you off. You go back in the house. A couple minutes later, you look out there. They're still playing catch across the rooftop. You go back out again. Boys, I ask you not to do that. Okay. You go back in. A few minutes later, you hear a crash because the ball has slipped out of one of their hands and gone through the window. So now they're freaked out, right? They say, oh, my goodness, what have we done? We have completely disobeyed what we were told, and now we've broken the window. So they come in freaked out because they know your wrath is coming. So they come to you and they ask for forgiveness. What are you going to do? Well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm probably going to light them up and lift their feet up off the floor first. And then I'm going to ground them and I'm going to make them pay for that window. But when they come to us and they are regretful and they are sorry and truly apologetic for what they've done, are we not going to forgive them? I would say as a loving and gracious, gracious parent, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're probably going to go ahead and punish them but we're going to forgive them because we love them and we care about them. You know, when we go to God with our hearts ready to repent, truly remorseful and truly apologetic for our sins, God is going to forgive us because that's what He does. Because like we love our kids, God loves us the same way. But, but we have to be sincere with that apology. You know, you can tell if someone who has wronged you or hurt you is sincere with their apology. And you can also tell if someone's apology is lacking conviction. Well, you know what? God can tell too. So we have to be sincere with that apology. So when we go to God and we are sincere with that, that apology and we are truly regretful and we ask Him to forgive us, He's going to forgive us. And not only does He forgive us of those sins, but the Bible tells us in Psalm 103 that He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. That is far and wide, gone, forgotten. When we come to God with our, with our sins and we are truly regretful and we are truly apologetic and we truly repent, God removes those from His account. The, the, word, the word forget really, really means to let go. So in verse 9 of 1 John, He is telling us that God has removed our, our sins from His account. They're not there anymore. You know, think about King David, and he was a man of God's own heart. But he sinned against God. But what did he do? He went to God. He asked God to forgive him of his sins. And God did that. In Psalm 32, 5, it says, Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my sins are gone. Our confession is such a vital part. Why is that? It's because of God's character. Because in God's own words, he says, If you confess your sins to me, I will forgive you of those sins. And I'm pretty certain that God's not a liar. Therefore, when we realize that we have sinned against God and that we need Jesus to come alongside us and cleanse us up, and we go to God and say, God, will you forgive me for I have wronged you? God's going to forgive you. God's forgiveness is not some superficial act of mercy. God is true to his word, and his character is to be faithful and just. And that's exactly what he is. So when we confess our sins to God, God is going to clean us up and He's going to forgive us of those sins. God's love flows like a river. You know, and it's, it's there to clean our hearts and to eradicate that sin that we've had. So the second part of the question that I was given was actually, when the thought of that sin enters back into your mind, are you, still, are you sinning again? And let me be clear. Any thought that comes into your mind that is displeasing to God, is sin. Anything we speak that is displeasing to God is sin. Any of our actions that are displeasing to God are sin. Jesus says in Matthew 15, 19, 
For from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. It's a heart problem. That's where it comes from. So I, I wanted to look at this question from two different views. And the first, first thought would be, if that sin pops into our head, and, and are we considering acting on that thought or that temptation? Or the second part would be, if that thought pops into our head, is it more a thought of regret and remorse from that past sin? And we have no desire to act on it. So if it's the latter and it's just a thought that's popping into your head and you have no desire to act on it, you need to know that that's Satan and he's working against you. Because, you know what, Satan plays serious mind games with us. That's what he does. Because he wants nothing more than destroy everything that God has worked for in you. Now, temptation itself is not a sin. But if we act or follow through on that temptation, that's when we've stumbled. And that's when we've, that's when we've given in to the sin. Uh, you remember earlier I, I was talking about that apology lacking conviction. Well, Proverbs tells us in 26.11, As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his foolishness. So I, I have a couple of examples I want to look at this morning. And, and the first one is adultery. So if you, go, if, if you have cheated on your spouse and you go to God and you ask God to forgive you of that sin, God is going to forgive you. Now working things out with your spouse, that's a little bit different thing. That's between you and your spouse and, and you have to work that out. But God has forgiven you of that sin. Because we go back to verse, verse 9 in John 1, it says, If we confess our sin to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us. That is, of course, that's all contingent on our heart. Where is our heart at in this situation? Are we truly sympathetic or are we truly apologetic when we go ask God for forgiveness? Now let's say that six months down the road, that thought pops into your head again. And you start, you start reminiscing about that time and you have a smile on your face when you do so. Or you follow through and you act on that temptation. Then by that thought and by that action, we have sinned and given in to temptation. Again, we have to ask ourselves, were my thoughts pleasing to God and were my actions pleasing to God? Now, you know, we, we, must, we must know that when, when things pop into our head, that that's of Satan. So if that thought pops into our head again six months down the road, but we have no desire to act on it. And we got to know that, hey, that's Satan. Satan's putting that thought there and he's working on us, okay? Because that's what he does. Satan wants to destroy us. So I have to ask, you have to ask yourself, hey, am I, am I watching over and am I praying that I don't fall into that temptation? Maybe you struggle with alcoholism and you've gone to God and you've asked God to forgive you because you know that drunkenness is a sin. And God has forgiven you for that. Once you ask Him to forgive you, if your heart felt sincere about that, God will forgive you of that sin. But a couple of months down the road, the thought of getting drunk pops back into your mind and you start reminiscing and you say, man, Really like that. That made me feel so good. You got to stop and ask yourself again: Is that thought pleasing to God? If I follow through and I go out and get drunk, is that going to please God? You know, these are just a couple of examples, but but this could this could really go with anything in our life that displeases God. That could be pornography. That could be stealing. That could be lying, drug abuse, anything in our life that is displeasing to God. This could fit into that category. Do you, do you remember a few years back when the WWJD slogan was real big, what, what would Jesus do? Well, what did Jesus do when he was tempted? In Matthew 4, 10, and 11, it says, Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus. Jesus resisted Satan. And you know, that's, that's what we have to do. We have to resist Satan and his schemes and his ploys. We have to watch and pray at all times, the Bible tells us. In Matthew 26, 41, it says, Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. See, we have a tendency as humans to give Satan a little bit of influence when it comes to our lives. And we don't even realize it. You know, the enemy will try to convince us that, Hey, God's not really forgiving you. God doesn't want to use you. Or, hey, God doesn't even love you. That's what he does. He tries to deceive us. And, and we 
we have we have to resist him. Hey, do you, do you think it's possible that maybe sometimes we're a little harder on ourselves when it comes to forgetting the things of our past? That we let them linger around and we hang on to them longer than we should? You know, I, I like to say that we have this we have this mental Rolodex in us. And if you don't know what a Rolodex is, you were probably born after 1999. And you probably got a cell phone or a laptop or a tablet or something like that. But a Rolodex was a little box that you set on your desk or on your, on your counter at home. And you had little flip cards in it. And on those cards, you could write phone numbers, addresses, or other stuff that you didn't want to forget. So if you needed to find something, you just thumb through those, those cards until you found what you were looking for. Well, our mind works the same way. We have all these things, all these thoughts and, and things up there that, you know, some of them are good, but some of them are things that we really need to get rid of. And, and the longer we let those things linger up there and hang around up there, the more Satan's going to flip through those cards, and he's going to pull the things to the front that he can use against you. See, because Satan knows the things that hinder us, that bog us down, and that keep us from moving forward. And Satan knows what he can use to tempt us. Satan will try to flip through my cards sometimes. And he'll say, hey, you remember the time you did this or the time you did that? Or he'll say, hey, you remember how much fun we used to have back before you were sticking in the mud? And one of my favorites is, just think, if you had not done that, where you could be today. You know, Satan, Satan keeps pushing that junk to the front of our Rolodex because he, he doesn't want us to move forward. He wants us to stay right there where we're at. He knows, he knows that if he keeps pushing that stuff to the front, that we're not going to be able to focus on furthering the kingdom of God. Because the last thing that Satan wants us to do is to be able to reach the lost. And our testimony and what, what Jesus has done for us is the best way for us to do that. You know, it's not God standing there dangling those things over our head, reminding us of those things all the time. That's Satan doing that. That's what he does. You know, he, he's, he's telling us that, you know what, your past is still there. I'm not going to forget about it. Why should you? And that's the last thing we got to do. We have to tell Satan, be gone from me. I'm done with you. You don't own me anymore. I am a new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ. I am free from the law of sin and death by the blood of Christ. It is time to forget those things in the past and leave them there because that's where they belong. The past is nothing more than a hindrance to us. Whether it's good or bad, the past is only going to slow us down and keep us from moving forward with the work that Jesus has done in us. We have to tell, we have to tell uh, Satan that God has forgiven me, He has cleansed me, and He has made me new. I forgive myself because God has forgiven me. I'm moving forward because God has, has cleaned my slate, and it's time that I get moving in the right direction. It's time to part ways with that junk that I've been hanging on to. The God we serve is sovereign. He is just, and He is all-knowing. But He is also righteous. He is gentle. He is kind. And He loves each and every one of His children very much. And He wants nothing but the best for us. You know, if you're living this morning with, with doubt or fear about your positioning with God, or maybe maybe you're missing out on that real and life-changing relationship with Jesus, or maybe you have a relationship with Jesus and you just got Satan up there flipping through that Rolodex, pulling things to the front and keeping you distracted, there's no better time than the present to ask Jesus to remove those thoughts and those fears from you. There is no better time than the present to ask the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart. Are you ready for a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious? Hey, there's no better time than today. Hey, I thank you. Let's, let's go to the Lord prayer. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity today, Father. Lord God, this is a blessing, Father, and I just thank you, Lord, for, for everything you've done for me. Lord God, I just ask that this message was, was touching someone's heart today, Father. Lord God, I just thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Give our brother some honor this morning. Amen. You know, Cody spoke a very, very poignant, powerful message to us all this morning. Answering that question, you know, when we have come to God...
when we've repented of our sins, we've turned away, how do we really know that He's forgiven us? And then once again, as we move into that real and life-changing relationship with Jesus, and then we think back on those moments when we were in sin, but we begin to literally, we're tempted to enjoy those moments in our mind. It's sin. But how great it is to know that our God is so loving and so kind and so compassionate. He is the God of 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th chances to infinity. It does not matter how many times you mess up. He does not want you to continue living that way. Because His grace is so great, should we continue sinning? No. No. Get brand new. Get that slate wiped clean. I'm so thankful, so very, very thankful for how God forgives us and gives us those second chances and helps us to move on. This morning, I want to encourage you. Would you stand up with me? Cody has, uh, has already offered a prayer over you today. Um, but I, I want to take it just a little bit deeper, and I want to know maybe who in this place really would say, Pastor, I, I'm, I'm not at that point where I'm, where I'm, where I feel like I'm saved and I'm looking back and struggling with those times before when I was not living for God. I, I'm, I'm in need right now of God's grace because I'm living in a lifestyle that I know doesn't please God. And I want that clean slate experience with Him. And I want to tell you right now, just as I was sitting down in that chair, what went through my mind is, man, if I was, if I was living in, 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 uh, in sin, in a life that was separate from God, like I was for a long time, I remember what it was like thinking to myself, I can't live like they're, like they're talking about. I can't match the kind of lifestyle that they're projecting off that platform. I just can't even begin to think about the steps that I would need to take, the, the, the things that I would need to do differently to really be able to make that happen. I don't even know where to begin. And I want to tell you right now that that's the enemy. He's such a liar, and, and he wants to convince you that you can't do it. He wants to convince you that it's complicated. He wants to overwhelm you with all this stuff that you'd have to do differently. And I want to tell you that it's so much more simple than that. You're making it too hard on yourself. God allows you hand in hand to just take your relationship with Him one day at a time. Sometimes one hour at a time. One minute at a time. And I want to tell you that there's nothing that God is going to call you to that He's not going to empower you to be able to walk through. You can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens you. You can do it. And I want to pray for you this morning. If you would bow your heads, please, and close your eyes. And I want to know who you are. I was just talking to you. And you, you heard my voice. You heard the Lord speaking through me to you. And you know that you need that life change that I'm talking about. Don't worry about how you're going to do it. Right now, in this moment, all we're doing is acknowledging that that's you. And then I'm going to walk you through a prayer that's going to change your life forever if you will mean what you say. Don't worry about the details. This is your moment. This is your time to live life differently. You're going to experience joy like never before. You're going to experience peace that surpasses all understanding. You're going to experience life as God had intended for you to experience it. And that is with Him. You don't know happiness. You don't know real pleasure until you learn to know my Jesus. That's what he's all about. So as eyes are closed and heads are bowed this morning, I'm going to count to three. And when I do, I want to know if God was talking to you. And if he was, I'm going to pray with you. I'm not going to call you up front. I'm just going to pray with you right where you're at. And we're all going to pray together as a family. So are you ready for life change on three? Ready? One, two, three. Who are you? Raise your hand this morning. Come on. Raise that hand up high. Amen. I see you in the back. I see you guys. I see you. I see you. God sees you. God loves you. He sent His Son to die for you. He loves you that much. And so now this is your moment where you can call upon the name of Jesus.
to be different, to make your home secure in heaven. And here's how it works. Pray this prayer with me. Father, I love you. I thank you for Jesus, your son. I know that I've made mistakes. I have set myself apart from you. And I want to know you more. Forgive me of my sins right now, God. I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that your son came and he died on a cross for me. He was put in a tomb and he rose again on the third day overcoming death and sin and hell. I confess with my mouth right now that Jesus Christ is Lord. I dedicate my life from this moment forward. I will live for you, O oh God. I will live according to your word. I will live according to your commandments. Surround me with godly people. Make your house my home. Set my feet on the solid rock. Make my path straight. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Give a hand to those who accepted Christ this morning. And again, what a great word by Brother Cody this morning. Give it up. Awesome job. Awesome, awesome job. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. If you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself, give to our ministry. We've made giving easy here at Mountain Movers Church. If you have your smartphone, just text the number 918-223-8090. Just push in the amount you want to give and push send. It's that easy. If you don't have your smartphone, not a problem. You can mail your giving just as easy to 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. Thanks for watching today. Hey, remember, we're dreaming big for you. We'll see you next week.